So I want to move on to a discussion now of Derrida's book of Grammatology. This is the standard edition that you always see of this book, and it has uh, the moon god Tot, the Egyptian god Tot, who is also the god of writing, and you can see that he's carrying with him, uh, a, in one hand he's got the reed instrument that the Egyptian scribe used to paint on papyrus, uh, the Egyptian hieroglyphics, and on the other hand he's got the writer's toolkit, which is a, a wooden slab, uh, like a little drawer basically, that has his inside which he can keep his reeds, like pens, and then he can pull the pens out, the reed pens out, and there are two little ink wells uh, that he can dip the reed in, one for red, one for black. Everything in Egypt comes in pairs, uh, and that's not an a accident because Egypt is the land of uh, the great metaphysical oppositions uh, that Derrida is fond of deconstructing in metaphysical systems. In Egypt's case, it's Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt. Uh, the god of Upper Egypt in the south is Set, and the god of Lower Egypt in the north is Horus. And so the red and the black ink actually refers, though, to the red land, which is the desert, and the black land, which is the immediate uh, rich, fertile land along the, the Nile, the black. Um, and the red was normally used as a rubrication to begin new paragraphs in some cases, but most often to write the names of divinities in red. And this tradition actually comes down to this day in those uh, uh, editions of the New Testament where we have Christ's sayings uh, highlighted in red. Uh, that tradition comes right out uh, by a long uh, development from this Egyptian tradition. So he's got the, uh, the Egyptian moon god there on the cover. Now, Grammatology, this book came out in 1967, and it's his first major book. He had done uh, one or two books on Husserl before this, uh, but this is his first major book. Grammatology is simply the word that Derrida uses for the science of writing. And gramma uh, means uh, letters and words, but uh, notice that ology means logos. And so uh, it's actually the science of writing, and he's using uh, a metaphysical term to refer to a science that he's inventing that is based on deconstructing those very terms that he's going to use, which is why he'll say in this book that uh, the end of the metaphysical age is actually its closure, but not its ending, because he still has to use the terminology of the logocentric tradition of the metaphysics of presence and phonocentrism that the Western uh, metaphysical tradition is built up out of. So it is grammatology of the science of writing, even though he's deconstructing the logocentrism that made possible the very idea of, of a science of anything, a logos of anything. So then as we move into this book, uh, you'll notice that there's a big, long translator's preface here by Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak. Um, I would skip it. I always skip translator's prefaces. They are never illuminating, or at least very rarely. And this one is so long that it has to raise one's eyebrows about the motives of the professor putting the preface in here. Uh, one suspects that the professor wants to convey the impression that she owns the text and that she's the official spokesman of Derrida. And um, you have to question that when the, when the translator's preface is longer than any of the chapters in the book. Uh, that's worth raising eyebrows over. And that's why I always skip uh, translator's prefaces. They're, they're almost always badly written, and they never answer the questions that you want answered. Uh, and they take too long to get to the point anyway. So, Anyway, so if we go right to, the, to Derrida's text, um, this book is divided into uh, a number of sections, and part one is writing before the letter. Part two is nature culture writing. So there are two main sections, and he says in the book's preface that he wrote that uh, the first section is the, theor the theoretical matrix of the book in which he introduces uh, deconstruction and his, um, his agon against the logocentric tradition. And then part two, nature culture writing, will feature specific applications of these uh, of the theoretical matrix to specific texts, especially a long extended meditation on Rousseau's essay on the origins of, of language. And um, <clears throat> so then he begins with another little mini preface here called an exergue. Now an exergue is um, the inscription that is written on the back of a coin or underneath it, on the on underneath the image. So it's a little room that's left for inscription. And he has three initial exergues here, uh, three initial inscriptions. One is a quote from Mes ancient Mesopotamia that's basically an invocation to the sun god Shamash. Uh, skipping the one above it, it says, uh, O Shamash, the sun god, by your light you can see the totality of lands 
as if they were cuneiform signs. Now it's interesting that he begins this text with an invocation to the sun god, the Mesopotamian sun god Shamash. Um, the Babylonian name was Shamash. The Sumerian name was Utu. It's interesting because writing uh, emerges in the Mesopotamian tradition from the solar dynasty. In Egypt it comes out of the lunar tradition, uh, both the mortuary cult which is lunar and hence supplementary in the Deridian sense to the solar tradition and also it's introduced by the god Tote who is himself a lunar deity. You can see that his beak is curved there. The ibis beak is curved like the curved moon, um, the lunar crescent. Shamash though is the ancestor of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh comes from the city of Uruk, and it was in Uruk, in fact, uh, that as far as we know, writing was invented. It seems to have come into being 3300 BC in that city specifically to keep track of records and accounts of donations that were brought into the temples, or taxations is probably more likely, uh, that were brought into these temples. Now, um, Gilgamesh's father is a man named Lugobanda, and his father in turn is a man named Enmerkar. Enmerkar is the inventor of writing, and then Enmerkar has one more ancestor before him, I believe, and then Shamash. So uh, they're directly descended, although the Sumerian name for Shamash is Utu, they're directly descended from the sun. Uruk is the city of the sun, just as its sister city, Ur, is the city of the moon god. Uh, Manasin is the moon god, uh, but it's the moon uh, city of Ur that Abraham actually comes from in the, in the biblical tradition. So the one city, Ur, is supplemental in the Deridian sense to the solar city of Uruk. Now it's worth recounting the myth of the origins of writing just briefly since after all Derrida it, it basically invokes it here in Mesopotamia. Enmerkar uh, was the Lugal, that is to say the king of the city, at the time when the city of Uruk was at war with a city somewhere in the east that no one is sure where it was called Arata, and he sends a runner. So before writing has come into being, we're still locked into the oral tradition in which the runner has to memorize the message and he carries it over long distances and runs over to the city of Arata and delivers the message. The king of Arata gives him a counter message and he has to carry it back over to Uruk. And this goes back and forth for a while to the point that every time this poor runner does this, the message that he has to memorize keeps getting longer and longer and longer. And finally, it's too long for him to memorize correctly. So when he comes back to Uruk, he realizes that he's garbling the message. So Enmerkar says, well, I have a solution for this. We'll invent, uh, we'll do this, we'll invent writing. And he invents writing, which is, uh, is the impressing of the cuneiform stylus, uh, or the stylus in writing cuneiform on a clay tablet. He teaches him this, and of course the runner puts it in his pouch, heads over to Arata, and he gives the message to the king, but the king, of course, is illiterate, as is everyone else at this point, and the text says his brow darkened as he held it under the firelight. He can't read it, but Arata ends up having to submit to the yoke of a rook. The message of the story being, he who has writing uh, is at the center of the, creates an ethnocentric tradition to which everyone else is subordinate. So those cities that do not have writing are less sophisticated and are seen as inferior to those cities who do. It's the opposite, uh, in a certain sense, to the way in which Derrida says that in the logocentric tradition, writing is not privileged, it's secondary, it's supplementary. So that's the myth of writing that comes out of Mesopotamia that Derrida begins with here. Then he quotes uh, a little mini-narrative from Rousseau to the effect that uh, writing went through three stages, first with savage people drawing little pictures, uh, presumably these are uh, nomadic tribes, and then to uh, barbaric people, which are presumably people like the Egyptians who used hieroglyphics, and then finally to the alphabet, which is the most, it's the phonetic language that is the most, uh, uh, it's the highest in the tradition. And of course, the third quote here is from Hegel, alphabetic script is in itself and for itself the most intelligent, Hegel says here. And of course, because everything in Hegel, the more abstract something is in Hegel, the more he favors it, the higher he always puts it, the, the greater the privileges that he assigns to it uh, in his system. And even though Hegel deprivileges writing, uh, puts it as secondary to the voice in the metaphysics of presence, which the voice exemplifies, a writing is, um, of all the written systems in the world, it's the alphabetic, the phonocentric, uh, the phonetic form of writing that's the closest to the phonocentric tradition that he uh, privileges. And then so he says, what I'm going to do here is talk about, Derrida does, uh, logocentrism, 
and logocentrism is a metaphysics that privileges and controls the concept of writing, the history of metaphysics, and the concept of science. It is that which makes science itself, scientificity itself, possible. Uh, and then he says he's going to found, or at least uh, set in motion, grammatology, this, which means the science of writing. And basically, this is a European equivalent of media studies. Now, this book came out in 1967. Media studies is already fully up and running in the West, uh, in America. By that point, it's invented uh, in Canada by uh, Harold Innes in uh, Empire and Communications and the Bias of Communication, both right around 1950, and then McLuhan right after him with The Mechanical Bride, and then in the early 60s uh, with The Gutenberg Galaxy and Understanding Media. 1964 is the date for Understanding Media. And so that tradition was already up and running together with Walter Ong. And, uh, but Derrida clearly did not know anything about this American tradition at this point. So there's a certain media theoretical naivete about this book. Um, it's as though he thinks he's founding something that doesn't exist yet, but it certainly does, and it's, it's already been invented by the Americans. Uh, and then so we move on to the first chapter, uh, which is called The End of the Book and the Beginning of Writing. Now, by the end of the book and the beginning of writing, what he means here is that the end of the book is basically the end of what McLuhan would have called the Gutenbergian era, but which he calls, this, in his case, uh, for McLuhan, that only extends from the printing press down to the 19th century, but for Derrida, it's the metaphysical e epoch, which is logocentric and begins more or less with, with Plato, but he also includes the pre-Socratics in there and goes all the way down to Husserl, uh, and he also extends it to include Heidegger even though Heidegger sees himself as outside of that tradition, Derrida includes him within it. The logocentric tradition goes all the way down. That tradition is logocentric because everything in it is centered around the idea of what Derrida calls the logos. And for Derrida, the logos is simply his term for the ultimate being idea that controls truth, and everything that can be said to be true or false is controlled by the idea of the logos in the Western tradition. Now, uh, as Her from what Heidegger said about being is that being is the ultimate metaphysical principle that differs from epoch to epoch, but it is by means of that principle that anything within that epoch becomes intelligible as such. So it's the sort of archi, the metaphysical principle that determines intelligibility as such. How anything is going to be true in a particular epoch depends upon that epoch's understanding of being. For the pre-Socratics, according to Heidegger, being was phusis, uh, and also aletheia, presumably. And then, of course, for Heraclitus, it becomes logos. Heraclitus is the first to use the idea of the logos as the ultimate cosmic ordering principle that puts everything in its right place. For Plato, the being idea becomes eidos, uh, the realm of the forms that have the ultimate ontological reality of which everything else is but a mere shadow copy. And then uh, we get the medieval tradition in which the infinite understanding of God is basically the great logocentric principle, the being idea, the transcendental signified is the term that Derrida uses in this book for the logos or being idea, by way of which uh, all other signifiers are measured. Their, their reality, their truth is true only insofar as they defer to and refer to the transcendental signified of God. So in the logocentric tradition, what we'll have then is, is to imagine uh, a sort of hierarchy of signifiers in which we have uh, signifiers themselves which are the legibility of writing, uh, the acoust so here's, uh, acoustic images, the actual printed text on a page. These are signifiers that have an arbitrary relationship to their signifieds. The signifieds are the ultimate metaphysical concepts uh, that the words on the printed page, the written words referred to, or on anything that's written or uh, that's uttered, uh, refer to the ultimate structuring concepts, the signifieds. But in the logocentric tradition, those signifieds only have and are guaranteed ontological reality insofar as they are grounded in a further signified, the transcendental signified of the logos, the being idea, God in the Middle Ages. Uh, later it would be Heidegger's idea of the ultimate subject and the ultimate object. Um, that's the logocentric tradition. It is the rationality that makes possible truth within the Western system, whether it's the adequatio theory of truth, whether it's uh, um, any other theory of truth uh, that's within that tradition is true only insofar as it refers to a transcendental signifier. 
that epoch is coming to a close, the end of the book. It's also an epoch in which writing is seen as secondary, um, 